Welcome to the presentation Energizing the Manufacturing Industry with Kubernetes and Cloud Native. My name is Marcel Wagner. I'm working in Intel's Network and Edge Group as software architect, and I'm located in Munich, Germany. The agenda of my presentation is as follows. First, I will give context and motivation why Cloud Native is relevant for industrial and manufacturing. Then I will, I will provide semantic web standards in a, in a nutshell, because it turns out that semantics becomes more and more important in the space. I will show the cloud native architecture derived by the industry fusion project, give an overview about how Kubernetes operators are used, especially how a new one has been developed to support analytics in the semantic space. I will provide a demo give my conclusion, and after that, hopefully, we will have a live Q&A session. One of my job tasks is to work with small and medium businesses in Europe in the manufacturing and industrial space to support them to adapt new software technologies. Small and medium businesses, for all purpose, are companies with less than 250 employees. But when you look at the overall statistics, you will realize that their contribution to the added value in the economy is huge. Therefore, they are very interesting to work with. And um, the structure is very special. Normally, they're family owned. Um, they're very focused. Some of them are even market leader in specific niches. In the industrial sp uh, space, um, the challenge is that many of them just started their Industry 4.0 journey. So when you look at their factories, you still see a lot of heterogeneous machines from different vendors, even very old machines, and it's very, very tough to provide an environment where all everything works together. And also, there is not yet a common open platform where everyone feels comfortable because one fear of the SMBs in industrial is to lose control over their data if they provide it to third party. In order to address that, more and more small and medium enterprises in different domains are getting together and creating organizations to define the rules of their digitization. One of them is Industry Fusion Foundation, which allowed me to report of, about their project state. And the Fusion Foundation um, consists of around 60 manufacturers and stakeholders in the metal processing industry in Germany. They're very focused, metal processing or metal sheet processing, cutting, welding, deburring is main things they're doing. Of course, they want to align with the overall Industry 4.0 activities in Germany and Europe, but at the same time, they want to own the base platform. That means they want to own the semantics of the machines and the semantics of the use cases. In order to address a wider space and collaborate with more ecosystem partners, they decided to open source the project and another very interesting decision was to go from cloud native and see what of this technology can be applied to the factory. In Munich, you can book a tour in the factory of a very famous car manufacturer and watch how dancing robots, highly automated, creating very nice cars. And you might think everything is done, right? Automation is a no brainer. Everything is optimized, and there is no big issue with industry 4.0. But then you go 50 kilometers outside of Munich into a smaller factory, and you are more likely to see something like this. So this is showing a very simple cutting, metal sheet cutting use case or setup. So the machines are cutting, but when they are cutting metal sheets, the, the safety regulation demands that the air is filtered. So today, 
this regulation is fulfilled by a dry wire. So the filter runs on maximum and when the cutter is on, the filter is on. But apparently this is not very economical and not very highly automated. When you knew more about the whole process, like for instance, what is the dimension of the workpiece? Um, what is the material of the workpiece? Then you could save money by reducing the filter strength and power by retaining the air in the factory without blowing it out of the factory and by managing the hazard status uh, of the filter cartridge to make it cheaper to when you dispose it. But it's so obvious that you can save money. Why is it not done? There are challenges. Right? One challenge is, which is maybe not very technical, but still technical, that um, when you change such systems, you need a safety certification. And that might be, in some cases, not even possible or very expensive. But when you also talk to domain experts, experts on the cutting machine, experts on the filter, um, they have no formal way to talk about their use cases and show the benefits of this. Also, when you look at the use cases, um, you need to combine information from different domains, like material, building, processes, environmental, to create the best benefit out of that. And if you only look at the return of invest, of course, it's not very economical to um, do only one use case and deploy an infrastructure for that. So whatever you do, the framework must be more capable to support all kinds of use cases. Otherwise, this infrastructure will never be deployed. The solution the project came up with was to go much beyond metric collections and dashboards. They decided that they need semantic web modeling of the environment. So with semantic web standards, you can add relationships and uh, context to your data. You can relate knowledge or ontologies from different domains, such as material, uh, with the knowledge you have in your specific domain. You can even use that to formally assess safety requirements from the formal description. And you can collaborate uh, on use cases independent of a specific platform because you have a platform independent description. Therefore, semantic web standards are very important in this space. And I am now giving a quick overview. The key ingredient of semantic web is the resource description framework. And it starts very simple. So everything is a subject, a predicate, and an object. Uh, subject and object, apparently notes, and the predicate is the link between it. And when you, when you take this triple structure, you can, of course, define much more complicated or arbitrary complicated graphs. On the right side, you see another example where you can combine typing, like um, you have a type system, like you know, plasma cutters are derived from cutters, and a cutter of this UN is a plasma cutter. But you can also um, define and describe other things like serial numbers or where the machine is located in. Is that you can define pretty complex knowledge trees but also models of your environment. And you need a way to further structure it. And for this, JSON-LD comes very handy. JSON-LD is JSON linked data. And with JSON-LD, you can still operate on an existing graph, RDF graph, but you can group it. You can, for instance, say in my graph, I have um, a workpiece, I have a plasma cutter, I have a filter, I have a filter cartridge. And with that, you can even export or import plasma cutters into your system and link them with other entities like a filter. On the right side, you see an example on JSON-LD. It is made in a way that it's 100% compatible with JSON specification. So all the tools 
which are able to process JSON can also work on JSON ID. And it provides you some additional information uh, about the semantic web. And this information is typically started with an ad. But now you have a model, you have information, you have knowledge, but what, what do you do with that? That's a very central question. And to define your constraints and how you operate on the graph, there's another language called shapes constraint language, Shackle. With Shackle, you can now say, look, this is my graph. You have rock piece, plasma cutter, filter, filter cartridge, but the plasma cutter must be connected exactly once with a filter. And the filter must be of a specific class, in this case, IFF filter. And if this does not happen, it's a severe, very severe problem. You see on the right side, an example, how Shackle looks like. And with that language, you can, of course, um, look for much more complicated relationships in your graph. For instance, you can make a statement about uh, the plasma cutter has a state and the filter has a state. You can search for it and relate it and say, when the plasma cutter is on, the filter must be on. Another example is when you uh, the plasma cutter is processing a workpiece, you can derive from the material of the workpiece the hazard or waste class of the filter cartridge because everything is linked. You have only to formulate, uh, first of all, what states are problematic and what uh, manipulations or what changes you want to do on the graph. To summarize it, um, the RDF resource description framework is needed to define knowledge graphs and context. JSON AD is helping to serialize resource description framework in a human readable way and also grouping relevant parts of the model for you. And Shackle is the language where you can define constraints on knowledge graphs and entities. You can um, define constraints between entities. And um, you can um, also define uh, rules how to operate and how to change the graph. So with that, you have a very expressive way to define use cases um, and, of course, constraints, for instance, for safety, and have um, a language and a platform to collaborate in a specific domain. Now, when you look at such a system, right, you have huge graphs and those graphs are updated by the data coming from the machines. Um, you see it's looking really closely to a streaming analytics problem, but you not, in, not only need to map the information in real time to the graph, you have also to check every single event coming in, whether it's, um, um, having or creating a problem, whether the whole system is still fulfilling the constraints, and if not, what has to be done. The knowledge graph, so the domain knowledge might, might, might be huge. So um, you better have a scalable system. And then when you look at Shackle, you will realize that it's a pretty declarative system. So you define what states you want to have, what not, and what to, what to do if you are in a specific state. So whatever this system you derive, it must be able to work in the declarative space. Low latency is needed. And um, one rule from Industry Fusion Foundation was to say, when you have two frameworks, select always the more generic one, which has the broader communities, because they want to the technology that stays for longer time. The decision which was made was to use graph knowledge tree versus relational JSON LD going towards relational using streaming SQL. Scalability, stateful data processing, low latency is fulfilled by using Apache Flink and Apache Kafka. And um, from the beginning, we derived also the requirement to do as much as possible with Kubernetes. So that led to a simplified architecture, which you can see here. 
filter and cutting system are sending data by MQTT to which is bridged to Kafka. And on Kafka, you have Apache Flink operating on the data which comes in. The concrete logic, how Apache Flink operates, is provided by an Inner Diffusion semantic operator. And we show how we derive from the semantic descriptions the actionable processing pipelines. The time series data is stored in Apache, Cass uh, in Apache Cassandra and managed with the K8 Sandra um, operator. To manage the JSON LD part, we have uh, the Scorpio broker, which is also connected to Kafka and which needs Postgres for saving the, the state. And then you need a human being or um, an, a more intelligent application, which is receiving the alerts, but also able to configure the system, like making sure that the right cutter is connected with the filter and the model and that the model reflects the reality. But you can also have uh, applications operating on the data models. To derive the actionable processing pipeline, the uh, project develop um, an operator and a framework how to derive from Shackle, which we just saw, the data description and the data manipulation. Here you see, for instance, that um, data uh, tables are created for alerts and of course for the models like cutter, filter, and whatever you define in this environment. But then you want also to operate on the data. You want to detect whether constraints are um, broken, violated, or you want even to trigger an alert. And that's what you see on the right side. So when you, for instance, want to alert, create an alert based on a specific observation, the operation, the SQL operation would be something like insert into alerts and then you condition your checking. To make this work in a um, in, in general environment, we um, uh, centered it around Apache Kafka. So um, we operate on tables, right? We derive rules on tables, but actually when you talk about streams, those tables are topics. So therefore there's a link between tables and topics. Uh, for instance, when you have the cutter um, or the filter or the machine table, you map them to topics. So when you, when, for instance, the, the broker is changing a cutter, it will also forward it over the bridge to the topic. When you want to get an alert or see an alert, you insert something into the alerts table. But actually, again, it's a Kafka, um, it's an event on a Kafka topic. And with that, you can even integrate other services with specific topics. In order to manage those streaming SQL jobs, the project creates several CRDs. And the, on the left side, you see the description, table description called Beam SQL table. Um, you can define you know, columns or fields of your table, but you can also link it with Kafka. You can say that's a Kafka topic and that is how you reach Kafka. On the right side, you see um, a structure and a custom resource, which is called Beam SQL statement set. This is needed to manage all the SQL statements you derive from Shackle. So it can be 20, 30, hundreds, and put them, put them into one object and let the Flink optimizer create an optimized pipeline out of that. And now I will show a demo. Now I switch to my Linux system to show the demo. I'm starting with showing the shackle file, which as discussed, provides all the constraints and the operation on the graph. So here's an example. We are saying that there must be a class cutter. Class cutter has, for instance, a state, exactly one state. Um, it has 
one filter, exactly one filter. Um, and uh, the filter must be of class IVF filter. And if this, this requirement, this constraint is not met, it is uh, it has a high severity. But you can also define much simpler constraints, like saying uh, a string must have a specific pattern or a specific length. You can, um, for instance, the material, uh, or you can define min and max values, like you know the depth can have a, can have a specific min and max value. But you can also describe more advanced constraints. This is an example where you make a requirement on the knowledge on the on the graph, and you're saying look at the cutter state and the connected filter state. And if the cutter is running, the filter is not running, then have an alert with a very high severity. So now we have the file with all the constraints. But how does it get into a real pipeline? For this, uh, Industry Fusion uh, developed uh, tools. And I'm now executing all these tools in the script. And in a second, you will see that um, after some tests, everything is deployed. And now you can, for instance, take a look at um, So there are table described uh, or deployed dependent on the shackle description and statements as, des as described, for instance, shackle validation. So when you look at shackle validation, then uh, you see that it's a custom resource containing a list of SQL statements, all SQL statements derived from the shackle file. So this has been deployed as custom resource. It means it will be collected and deployed as Kubernetes as um, link pipelines. You see a pipeline has recently 25 seconds deployed here, this shackle validation pipeline. When you click on it, you see that it's actually a huge pipeline derived from all the shackle descriptions and all the SQL scripts. And um, to, sh to show the pipeline, we um, show the alerter tool, which is, as described earlier, connected to the respective bridge. And in other words, with the respective alerts table, right? Now, if I um, create objects, I can either do it directly from the machines over uh, MQTT or Kafka, or I can do it over the broker, uh, the JSON LD broker. That's what I'm not doing because it's it's more handy. So, for instance, I submit an object describing a plasma cutter. So it has an ID, it has a type plasma cutter, and provides the fields which have been defined in Shackle, like state, workpiece has filter, and has filter is the defining an URL to a specific filter. So let's submit that. And as a result, the analysis happens of the shuttle pipeline and realizing two problems. One is that the filter that is not connected to, um, well, cut is not connected to a filter. So that is a severe, with high criticality mistake. Another not so high, um, constraint um, violation is that there is no workpiece connected to a cutter. Now, I submit in the same way uh, a filter and submit it to the system and the same uh, described and with strength and cartridges and so on. And I now submit that. You see that the um, alerts are changing, so the uh, old severe one is deleted, but now you have a new one because the filter doesn't have a cartridge. And now by deploying the other, like the workpiece, 
and a cartridge, you see that the model is now compliant. Um, but you can also other do other things, like for instance, now I'm switching on the filter. And um, as described earlier, now it's comparing it with the state of the uh, switching on, sorry, the cutter. And now it's comparing it with the state of the filter, and it's a critical error. Um, filter is off. Uh, so either you switch on the uh, off the cutter or on the filter. Let's switch on the filter with this JSON LD API. And with that, uh, you see that the um, model is again in um, um, in okay with the constraints and all, all constraints are fulfilled and there are no alerts created. And with that, you can create arbitrary uh, relationships on a large graph. So I'm now switching back to the presentation. One question to ask is, of course, does Kubernetes fit to industrial small and medium businesses? From my point of view, the answer is yes. Kubernetes helps a lot to unify the operations from cloud to edge. Um, this is applicable to a large amount of typical edge operations in a factory. At the same time, it's also fair to say there is still a lot of technologies like real time and safety, which are not yet uh, measurable with Kubernetes. Maybe that is something for future research. People are questioning at the beginning, do I need Kubernetes? Do I need cloud native? But then you can ask them if it's not Kubernetes and you want to manage from cloud to edge, what else is it? And do you think it exists in five years? Um, the On cloud native, you can also ask them to do, do the math. What is their aspiration? You start, of course, small, but where do you want to go? And how many use cases you need to be uh, really have to see a good return of invest. And then you realize that um, it is a system which, which must be scalable. Problems exist with small, small and medium businesses. Uh, they have no IT department and challenges with IT and therefore also with Kubernetes. At the same time, that can be um, solved by support from organizations like Industry Fusion Foundation um, and uh, also the pure amount of Kubernetes tutorials, examples, courses, uh, and so on is creating a lot of trust. Finally, the line between operation technologies in the factory and the IT part is anyway blurring more and more because the new, ups, the new uh, college graduates have touched Kubernetes and containers also at the university and at the college, and therefore are a little are already familiar with that and not afraid of it. The conclusion I've shown that semantic web standards and industrial help to make people collaborate in specific domains, but also across domains, helps to assess or pre-assess safety issues, validate data, operate on data, and link data from different domains together. The Industry Fusion Foundation Digital Process Twin is using Shackle to derive constraints and operation rules. Cloud Native helps to have the right scalability and high availability in operations. Uh, Kubernetes operators are used where possible and feasible. Postgres uh, with Zalando, Cassandra with KH Thunder, Apache Kafka, Streamsy, Apache Flink comes with some built in Kubernetes capabilities. Keycloak and MinIO also come with operators. And then another operator had to be developed to manage the translation from semantic descriptions to um, a real time pipeline on Flink and Kafka. Future work, improved tooling, semantic web is not yet everywhere. Um, this has to be become more native. Um, we have to look. Uh, not only we, I guess many people look at that, how those static or whether they are static Kubernetes setups more suitable for real time and safety. Uh, and then uh, another uh, hot topic is uh, look at semantic web standards to create um, or to speed up certifi safety certifications. So there are 
um, certifiers in the industry fusion project who are looking at such topics. In general, please check it out, take a look, give us feedback, contribute. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>